Welcome back everyone, and a special welcome to all of my new subscribers. A few days ago, with the assistance of the wonderful Marvel Girl, I passed the 1000 subscriber mark and I'm quickly on my way to 1100. For anybody new to the channel, this platform is mostly for providing scientific evidence in support of the globe model of the Earth. But as part of that endeavor, I've been building an experiment to test the theory of gravity. One of my first videos went in depth about how Henry Cavendish first tested this theory in 1793. If you need a refresher on the origins of that experiment, click here. Well, for the past several decades, I have so badly wanted to actually do my own Cavendish experiment. Seven months ago, I found myself in Korea all by myself with an extra spare bedroom, so I thought, what the heck, let's do it. The original design was extremely simple. All I wanted to do was see the effect. But as I desired to get more and more accurate and remove so many of the variables, well, the experiment kind of took on a life of its own in my spare room and in my online community of followers. So today's video is the culmination of the build, a top-down explanation of what I've constructed and how the system will work. And in the following months, I'll put her to the test. So I give you my Cavendish. Firstly, I understand that this is not a perfect setup. There are many other things I could have done to isolate from all variables, but turning my entire spare bedroom into a vacuum chamber just wasn't quite feasible. So if you see parts of the experiment and want to scream out to yourself that I'm allowing in variances, I probably already know, and it's a risk that I've been willing to accept on that particular part. But I've done my best. The experiment itself is located in my spare bedroom in an apartment in South Korea in the city of Daegu. I'm on the fifth floor of a 24-story apartment building. The window to the room has been covered with foil to block any sunlight from causing heat imbalances within the room, and my neighbors probably think I'm crazy looking at it from the outside. The torsion bar is suspended from a crossbeam that is literally a 2x4 wedged between the walls of the room. Originally I was hooked up to the ceiling, but I discovered that the ceiling was actually pretty flexible, and I wanted to isolate from my neighbors upstairs walking around, which would cause oscillations in the wire. While the crossbar does isolate fairly well from the walking, it is susceptible to vibrations horizontally. But there is little outside influence that could cause that type of vibration. And on the crossbar, I have an accelerometer, kindly provided by Where's Wally. This accelerometer wirelessly transmits every 30 seconds any vibrations and the value of which to a website that consistently and constantly logs the values. And this data is publicly available to anybody who would like to look at it. So stick around for that. One of the last additions I made to the entire experiment was a protective sleeve around the torsion wire. During a recent test, I left my apartment for a long weekend and when I came back, I turned on the air conditioning because it was hot. But each room has independent in-ceiling air conditioners, so that should not have caused any air currents in the room. But somehow it did. It didn't cause oscillation of the torsion bar. It caused sway of the wire. So I glued a PVC pipe to the suspension bar around the wire. Hopefully this will eliminate from any currents in the room pushing the wire left and right. I also ensure that the pipe is in no way in contact with the wire and will not affect the movements. The wire itself is a 0.017 millimeter guitar string. I tested multiple different types of wire and this came out to be the best fit. Not too much tension to prevent oscillation and not so little that the bar won't stop moving. I've had that problem before. The torsion bar itself is a one by one wooden dowel. I was able to find a nice Korean man who had a wood shop and he turned the ends for me so that the end of the dowel could be inserted to the M1 mass. The M1 is a three pound lead sinker weight. Well, originally it was three pounds, now it's a little less after I had to drill holes into it for the dowel. Many of you may remember that that project ended up with a trip to the ER. M2 are formed from a 40 pound iron dumbbell with the handles cut off. M2 is supported by a wooden plank resting atop a Lazy Susan. The Lazy Susan is connected via a rubber gear belt to a stepper motor. 
the entirety of this apparatus is located inside a semi-enclosed plexiglass box. All sides of the box are glued to the table, the two upper portions are glued in place. Due to the flexibility of the plexiglass though, I had to add the 1x1 one one dowel for support. The center plexiglass is cut in half to allow the suspension wire. These pieces can be removed to access the box. One point of non-enclosure is where that wire enters the box. The second point is where the stepper motor belt enters the box. Now I've covered as much of this hole with tape to prevent airflow. Control of the stepper motor will be done via my computer outside the room from an Arduino circuit board. Coding courtesy of Where's Wally. During experimentation, I will be observing via webcams and controlling the experiment from outside the sealed room, all through USB control. Inside the box, I have another accelerometer and two temperature sensors. The sensors are located in opposite corners, upper and lower portions of the box. There are also temperature sensors at the floor and affixed to the crossbar. All of these feed to a digital display, again provided by Where's Wally. The display reads all temperature sensors to include the temperature of the display itself and the atmospheric pressure of the display. Which temperature reading is which is located in the description below, and all of this is consistently streamed to thingspeak.com. Link in the description if you want to take a look at it and see what the temperature is in my spare room right now. With all the temperature sensors, I'll be able to gauge the changes throughout the day and ensure that it's not temperature variations that are causing any results. The experiment box itself is atop a table, and oddly the table is again on top of part of the dowels. The reason for this is because when I mounted the crossbar, I was not anticipating using the guitar string. And a guitar wire does not come on a spool, so I literally needed to raise the experiment to bring M2 in line with M1. Well, how am I going to make the measurements? Sharks with laser beams. Mounted on the suspension point of the torsion bar is a first surface mirror. This means that unlike a normal mirror where the reflective surface is behind the glass, this mirror reflects from the front, thereby causing no diffraction as the light goes through the glass. The laser itself is an experimental grade helium neon laser I found on eBay. I experimented with LED lasers, but their dispersion patterns and point sharpness were just insufficient for actual gathering good data. I could have used an astronomy pen laser, but those are battery powered and I need to be able to turn it on and leave it for days as the system rests and becomes to equilibrium. The entry point into the box where the laser goes through the plexiglass has been drilled out to prevent diffraction. This is another entry point of draft. At this time I do not intend to cut away the plexiglass for the exit point because that's going to be oblong and I'm not positive how I'm going to have to cut it. I may in the end, I'm not sure. To measure the oscillations for the bar, the laser itself is projected onto the far wall onto a metered strip. By picking a left or right spot on the laser as a reference point, we're able to identify the rest oscillation of the bar prior to the entry of M2, and then determine how far it deflects off of the norm once it comes to rest again. I've included two safety measures for other outside influences. Inside the chamber, I've included thin dryer sheets cut into strips. The sheets are cut to ensure they don't come in contact with M2 or M1, but will allow for a visual indication of air current inside the box. I've also run copper wire around the box, onto the plank for M2, and to the wire above and below the suspension point and out to the M1s. This is to remove possible static electricity inside the experiment. All of these wires are connected to the earth contact for the socket in the wall. I've also tested all of the components within the system for magnetic fields, to prevent the issue that magnetic pull might be the reason for the results. Neither the lead sinker weight nor the iron produces any measurable magnetic fields. The largest magnetic field I've found are the stepper motor, which is fairly small and outside the box, and the power inverter, which was huge. And that's the reason why the power inverter is now outside the room. The center of operations, as I said, will be outside the room, all connected through USB. I'm using OBS, and I will be able to observe and record multiple cameras, and the data streaming from the instruments. This is what the final video format should look like. I've run several experiments, some of them even broadcasting on YouTube. If you've seen them, you know it's like watching paint dry. So as the experiment moves forward, I think I'm going to move away from live streaming simply because I don't think a 12-hour broadcast for two minutes of excitement is fair to the audience. So for the initial runs, I will be recording and releasing an accelerated video and then a full video release immediately following that. 
That way, anyone can evaluate that experimental run in its entirety beginning to end to see if I missed something. I also plan on running a couple secondary tests. Right now, here's my plan. Run 1 will be M2 Alpha, which is the 40 pound lead weight. The second run will be M2 Bravo, which are 30 pound lead weights. Run 3 is going to be M2 Charlie, an empty box to simulate the size of the previous weights. This is to ensure that it's not the size of the weights moving through the box causing airflow that gives us the result we find. If I run the experiment with an empty box and there is no change, airflow isn't the cause. All of the exact measurements for all of the device and the data streams and historic videos are currently posted to a website that I made just for this experiment. I invite you to come over and take a look. And in the end, after everyone has evaluated the data for themselves, I may run a contest where I do an experiment with an unknown, just the box. Unknown if it's empty, or M2 Alpha, or Bravo inside. We'll call it the What's in the Box contest. Dan Champion, you've already won my last two. I'm expecting you as a big performer for this one, man. So that's my Cavendish. It's not perfect, but not too darn bad if I do say so myself. And I can't take entire credit myself. I've had so much support from the community for people who have offered improvements and other insight on how I could make the experiment better. And then there's those who have also supported financially through a GoFundMe. I cannot say thank you enough that you felt so confident in me in this experiment that you deserved it worthy of your money. Thank you so much. Stay tuned for more Globe Earth confirming science and the final results of a homemade Cavendish. Hang on, and let's go for a pretty awesome ride together.